About 10 years ago, I had a comment on a letter of evaluation sheet. For those of you who don't know what a letter of evaluation sheet is, it's something that students fill in to assess and mark the people who teach them. And the letter of evaluation sheet has questions, and the questions are things like, can you hear the letter at the back? Is the letter well prepared? Can you take a good set of notes? That kind of thing. And this student filled in the sheet and he crossed out all the questions. And in the margin he wrote, irrelevant. And in the comments box below, he said, he or she said, Jervis does not give lectures, he gives performances. <laughs> Now, I know that some of you are turning up here expecting to receive one of my performances and you're not going to. Um, I didn't do that last year and I'm not doing it again this year. I am actually going to read it. I know that some of you find that shocking, but that's what I'm doing. Before I start, I just want to make a couple of acknowledgements. First of all, I'd like to thank Douglas, who I thought was sitting over there, but he's not sitting there. Um, Douglas puts a lot of effort into producing the slides for me, and um, this lecture wouldn't be the same without his help. And the other person, pe two people I want to thank are Olga and Alex, who are sitting in the front row, and they've helped me with some of the number crunching. Oh, and I suppose I should thank all the students who voted for me, and the students who nominated me. Okay, right, I will now start. This lecture is motivated by two ideas. The first idea is that the introduction of fees was justified. The change in the funding of higher education introduced by successive governments since 1998 is, according to the argument of this lecture, justified. The change in funding I'm referring to is the introduction of fees. Fees were introduced in 1998 and you need to know some dates in this lecture, one of the dates you need to know is 1998. That's when a fee of £1,000 was introduced. In 2006, the fee was introduced from £1,000 to approximately £3,000, and next year, the fee will go um, to a minimum of about £6,000, and in this university, students will pay £9,000. The only alternative to fees paid by students, according to the argument of this lecture, was a continuation of what has been called unfunded expansion. Unfunded expansion involved ever-increasing number of students with an approximately fixed budget, with the obvious consequences for the quality of education. The argument that we're going to be looking at today assumes, of course, that fees have increased resources available to universities. However, the picture is a bit more complicated than that. A proportion of the fee now paid by students, or at least a proportion of the fee that's coming in next year, is a switch from tax funding to funding by students. In other words, a pound that came from the Treasury is now paid directly by the student. And that, in itself, does nothing to increase revenue. However, it's not the case that the entire fee represents a switch from tax funding to funding by students. The cumulative, cumulative impact of the fee regime introduced in 1998 has significantly increased revenue for universities in this country. It follows that students are entitled to see improvements in their education. The second idea I want to explore is that the changes in funding regime on their own offer no guarantee that students will receive a better education. The argument I want to examine was made by Ian Gibson, who is a backbench Labour and Member of Parliament. Ian Gibson was one of the rebels who voted against the Labour government's 2004 legislation introducing top-up fees. In the second reading debate, he made the following remark. I believe that the money will go to research, but not teaching. That is a problem when we are considering providing support for undergraduates. One has to know the structure of universities and how they operate. I therefore do not believe that students will get much extra value. It's 
It's worth saying something about Ian Gibson and who he was. He entered Parliament at the age of 59, which of course is very late. He spent most of his working life as an academic biologist at the University of East Anglia, where he taught for more than 30 years. He held positions as a lecturer, as dean of the School of Biological Sciences, and finally as a professor. As far as I know, there was no other member of Parliament who had his experience and understanding of how universities function. Unfortunately, his argument was completely ignored. It was ignored in the setting of the reading debate. No other MP took it up. And it was also ignored in the press and has more or less been ignored ever since. Almost nobody has focused on how the money will actually be spent. Of course, there is a focus about access. There's a huge debate about access, which I'm not going to discuss today. But the question of how universities spend money has received very little attention. My first academic post was as a research assistant to Professor Nick Barr at the London School of Economics. My job involved helping Nick with his proposals for income contingent loans. The system of loans we now have is based on proposals that Nick Barr put forward in the late 1980s. Working for Nick convinced me that the only viable system for funding universities must involve a substantial contribution by students. However, I have now been working at Bristol almost as long as Ian Gibson worked for the University of East Anglia, and I have difficulty in believing that anybody with direct experience of what Ian Gibson called the structure of universities can seriously doubt the force of his argument. This matters for two reasons. It matters for the quality of education, but it also matters because the new funding regime is unlikely to survive if students see no benefit from the enormous increase in fees that has taken place during the last decade. The lecture I gave last year was about how universities have changed since the publication of the Robbins Report. The focus of the lecture was on the huge increase in the number of students entering higher education and the funding crisis that created. The focus of today's lecture is on the balance between teaching and research and how that has changed over the last half century. In order to build on that argument, I will once again draw on the Robbins Report. As I explained in last year's lecture, publication of the report represented a watershed in higher education. The report did for higher education what the 1942 Beveridge Report did for Social Security. I also explained that the appendices to the report provide an unrivaled source of information on what it was like to be a student in 1963. So that's just a little bit of background, including what I did last year. Yeah. In last year's lecture, I divided the period since 63 into three eras. There's the era of what I called the Robbins era funded expansion. Then there is an era lasting roughly from 1980 until 1998, which is unfunded expansion. And then there is the period which I've called the impact of fees since 1998. Today, we'll, I guess I'll look at really unfunded expansion and the impact of fees. So what I want to do now is go back, though, to 1963 and answer in much more detail than I did last year what it was like to be, a, to be at university in 1963. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at detail on contact hours, class size, feedback, and PhD students teaching, the role of PhD students in teachers. So I'm going to be looking at contact hours as reported in the Robbins Report, class sizes as reported in the Robbins Report, feedback as discussed in the report, and the role of PhD students in teaching. So first, we'll begin with contact hours. Contact hours. In most subjects since 1963, there actually isn't much change in contact hours. Um, in sciences, there's almost none. In social sciences, there might be a small reduction, I think. This is all based on 
you know, my own understanding of what contact hours are like today, we don't have any comparable data. So we have very precise data for 1963, we don't have good data for today, which is an extraordinary state of affairs, but it's true. Um, for example, in economics, contact hours in economics, as reported in the report, average contact hours are almost exactly the same today as what they were in 1963. I think where there probably has been a reduction in contact hours is in the humanities. Um, for example, here, it's, here I've got some figures, 47% of students had between 10 to 19 contact hours per week in the humanities. Well, that's almost certainly higher than we get today. However, if you look across all disciplines, the strongest impression I have is one of continuity. For most students, especially students studying STEM subjects, contact hours today are almost identical to what they were in 1963. And to focus on contact hours as a measure of teaching quality is a very serious mistake. Class size. The Robbins report defines a tutorial as involving one to four students. It also defines a small seminar which involved five to nine students and then it involved what it then it, just, then it had a category which it called a large seminar which was more than ten students. And it gives precise figures for the number of hours students had in small you know, tutorial, in a small seminar and in a large seminar. And it breaks it down by university. Um, so the, the, the mass of detail in this report is amazing. Okay. I'll read two passages. In the humanities, and to a lesser extent in social studies, there is, there is considerable provision of tutorials at all universities. In scientific subjects, there is less tutorial teaching outside Oxford and Cambridge. At all Universities, seminar teaching is far more common in the arts than in science subjects. To sum up, class sizes have increased significantly in all disciplines, but especially in the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences. Feedback. Feedback is discussed again at length. There's an enormous amount of detail about how much work students got marked, etc. And once again, we don't have the same detail for today, so we're in this bizarre situation where we know more about how much feedback students received in 1963 than we do today. Direct comparison is therefore not possible. I will just quote um, the recommendation of the report, and the recommendation of the report was that every student should be regularly set written work, which should be returned and discussed with the student. However, it's fairly clear from the report that that condition was met in 63. In other words, in 1963, in the humanities, 70% and in social sciences, 65% of students received written comments and then discussed that work with their tutor. So you would get the essay back or whatever it was, you would have the feedback and then you would go and see your tutor. The overall impression you get reading the report is that students were satisfied with both the quality and the quantity of feedback. Now, just before I move on to the next subject, there's something I want to say about the interaction between feedback and class size, and I think this is something that's missed. The benefits of small classes are not confined to the classroom. If the number of students in my class doubles, it's more or less inevitable that I must spend less time marking. Precisely because marking is so time consuming, if my marking load per student doesn't fall, there isn't much point in increasing the class size. So increasing class sizes and poor feedback scores in the NSS are different sides of the same coin. Teaching by PhD students. I think I'll just read what it says there. PhD students did some teaching in 1963 but far less than today. In 1963, PhD students were used in science subjects to take practicals, but not by and large to teach. In the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences, the teaching by PhD students was close to non-existent. 
Okay, the balance between teaching and research. In several chapters, the report discusses what it calls the balance between teaching and research. And in this context, I want to quote a number of sections from the report. There are many persons of first-class ability who have never engaged in research. In the narrow sense, or have felt any urge to publish but whose breadth of culture, rightness of judgment, and wide-ranging intellectual curiosity are priceless assets in a department or a college. In 1963, there was no formal division of labor between teaching and research, but there was an informal specialization, and it was clear that the report approved of that informal specialization. If you read the report carefully, it's quite clear this is something the committee thought about, and it's quite clear that the committee strongly approved of a situation where some people focused on research and some people focused on teaching. Although, as I say, and I repeat this, it was an informal separation. You weren't on separate promotion paths, but the existence of some people who everybody knew weren't really research active was fine. That was accepted, and it was thought to be necessary. Another passage. Original work is essentially personal. And though it should be fostered and encouraged, it should not be forced or imposed as a duty on all teachers. That, of course, describes a culture uh, which has gone banished a very long time ago. <coughs> on the overall balance between teaching and research, the authors of the report were broadly satisfied. The committee believed that in 1963, I need to read this carefully, cases where research is carried too far at the expense of teaching are fewer than those where teaching time might well be lessened to permit more time for research. In other words, insofar as the report did propose a change, it almost was saying, look, you need to do a bit more research. There are some universities where, frankly, you're putting too much time into teaching. That was the direction, if any, that the report was hinting in. However, that view, the view that, if anything, some universities put too much effort into teaching and not enough into research, was tempered by the next quotation, which is critical. The extent to which a narrow criterion of academic excellence has invaded British universities is sometimes overstated. We are convinced that the danger exists. It may make persons without either the gift or any genuine urge to engage in research do so because they feel that promotion depends. And what the report was really doing there was looking across the Atlantic. They could see which way the wind was blowing. They could see that in American universities there was a focus on research that was starting to squeeze out teaching. And the report was anticipating that that process was going to go further and they were warning about it. <coughs> okay. The report makes 178 recommendations. I won't go through all of them. But there are two which are relevant. First, because teaching and research are complementary, research should not be removed from universities and concentrated in research institutes. Now that's something that the report was very eloquent on. They didn't want to see a separation at the level of institutions between teaching and research. They were emphatic that you needed to see both embedded in one organisation. However, they also wanted to see more explicit promotion criteria for teaching because I think they understood that the world was changing and the informal arrangements which they described, they knew those arrangements weren't going to continue working. So in appointing and promoting staff, more weight than at present should be given to qualities other than distinction in research and in particular to ability as a teacher. Summary. In 1963, on the eve of the Robinson expansion, students at British universities received an education that offered them the opportunity for extensive engagement with academics on a formal and informal basis, in genuinely small group tutorials, in seminars and discussion periods. Feedback frequently took the form of discussion with staff as opposed to written comments, although it was not uncommon for students to receive both kinds of feedback. Now, uh, we're going to, I'm now going to give you some data, okay? And the data will be looking at the winners and losers throughout the period of what I've called unfunded expansion. 
And then, the era of fees, and I will look at winners and losers. So what we're going to be looking at now, this, this, the next few slides are the crux of today, really. We're looking at the impact of unfunded expansion on different disciplines. Because most of the discussion of what happened to higher education just takes averages. It doesn't look at what was happening to the funding of different disciplines. And so we're going to be, I'm going to look at who the winners and losers were through that period of unfunded expansion. Then I want to look at who the winners and losers have been through the period of expansion. Sorry, of, of fees, I'm sorry, of fees. Okay. So to do that, we need to start with a table, and you need to understand there are these price bands. The price bands in 1963 were referred to as medicine, pure sciences, applied sciences and arts. And those price bands are bands A, B, C, and D. Today, they correspond to the clinical stages of medicine and dentistry and veterinary science. And then band B corresponds to lab-based subjects. That's engineering and most sciences. And band C applies to subjects with a studio, laboratory, or fieldwork element. And finally, D applies to everybody else. So if you are arts, humanities, social sciences, you're banned D. Next slide. Now, what we can then see is the fee that the government paid per student in 1962, 63. And what you can see is that for an arts student, it was £568. For a medic, it was £1,000. What you need to remember about those numbers is that the medic gets twice what an arts student gets. So the cost per student for a medic was double. And for the science subjects, the STEM subjects, it was in between. So now, we're, what we're looking at here is the bottom the bottom row is the humanities, and you can see that humanities recover. The humanities do worse because they go from 20, their funding falls to 29% of the 63 level, and they recover to almost 60%. And then the second row <coughs> is the medics, and the medics, their funding falls by least, and the impact for them of fees is smallest. And then the next row should in fact be the one that goes 136, 44, 43, because that's the most expensive of the two science subjects. And finally, the next row should be going 132, 44, 43, that's band C. And then finally at the bottom we get the humanity. Now I very much hope that a picture has emerged out of all that chaos uh, could you go to the next slide? Here we've got um, the same data presented slightly differently. And what you can see is that the yellow column is 1.87. It's a multiple. It's multiple is 1.87 times the humanities funding band. Right? And the other two STEM subject sciences they're 1.36 and 1.59. Now if you then go to 97, 98, what you can see is that a medic now gets four and a half times the funding of somebody doing humanities. So what you can see as we go from the left hand set of cylinders to the middle set of cylinders, what we're observing is how people doing humanities, arts and social sciences are losing out relative to the other two bands. Right? And then when you go to the third column, what you can see is the situation has returned much closer to what it was in 63. So the central argument I'm giving you now is to, is to understand that the funding of humanities, arts and social sciences has dramatically improved as a result of the introduction of Next slide. 
Underfunding of higher education was not uniform across all disciplines. The unit of resource failed by more in the arts, humanities and the social sciences than in medicine and STEM subjects. Since 1998, this situation has been partially reversed. Okay. A productivity miracle. One response to the argument set out thus far is to challenge the assumption that quality has risen. And that claim has been made in a 1996 paper that was published by the Committee of Vice Chancellors and Principals. They produced the number that productivity growth had risen by 6% per annum in the 1990s, compared to 2% in the service sector overall. Now, if that was true, it would imply a productivity miracle. Productivity growth of 6% in almost any sector of the economy would be astonishing. In, service, in, in public sector service growth, productivity growth of that, that rapid would be unprecedented and would have no parallel across the OECD. The problem, of course, is that the Committee of Vice Chancellors publication makes no adjustment for quality. If increasing class size leads to no reduction in quality, then productivity has increased, but in that case, class sizes should rise. If the increase in class size leads to a quality reduction and no adjustment is made for this, productivity growth will be mismeasured. If productivity growth of this magnitude is possible, unfunded expansion is the correct policy. In high productivity industries, prices should fall. If these numbers are taken seriously, the case for top-up fees unravels. In other words, the claims that have been made by universities about productivity growth, if they were really true, the government should turn around and say, well, you don't need any more money. What is missing from the narrative about tuition fees is any admission that students paid a price for the policy of unfunded expansion. It's almost impossible to construct a compelling narrative for higher fees unless this is acknowledged. The deterioration must be measured, at least in part, in terms of the student experience. This statement is true in terms of what we know about higher education and about how higher education has changed. It's also a political truth. If deteriorating performance has no impact on students, a compelling narrative supporting higher fees cannot be constructed. The formidable, the formidable difficulties that face politicians and academics trying to construct this narrative needs to be addressed. Of course, these arguments imply that students must see a direct benefit from the introduction of fees. Okay. And I want to go back to comments that Robbins made towards the end of his life. He wrote a book called Higher Education Revisited, and in this book he looked back at the work he did in 1963, and he kind of, he was reflecting on changes in education that had taken place since then. And he made a number of comments that I want to read to you. In the much smaller university population that existed in my youth, there was something like an appropriate balance between teaching and research. There were those whose major instincts tended to research and publication, and there were those whose impulses tended more to exposition and the care of students. In recent years, it seems to me that the position has changed. The emphasis in many universities has shifted quite definitely in favour of research and publication, at any rate, so far as establishment and promotion are concerned. I wouldn't say that things are as bad as they appear to be in some parts of the United States, where frequent publication is almost as necessary as a trade union ticket in a closed shop, but I think it is bad enough to be disturbing. Where promotion depends on publication, students and teaching tend to be neglected. Teaching and supervision tend to be regarded as evil, subtracting from one's research. Higher Education Revisited was published in 1980, long before the full impact of unfunded expansion, and six years before the first research assessment exercise. The shift in the balance between teaching and research resulted from the fact that British universities were already, as far back as then, converging on the US model. 
Greenaway and Haynes estimated in their economic journal article that deteriorating staff-student ratios led to a doubling of class sizes. We don't have data for today, but if you look at the data reported in the Roberts report, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the overall reduction in teaching that has taken place since the early 1960s exceeds that implied by a doubling of staff-student ratios. Unfunded expansion is not the only explanation of the decline of the Robbins era university. Universities do not produce one output, they produce two, teaching and research. If falling resources was the only thing that mattered, both of these outputs should have suffered. However, that is not the case. During the era of unfunded expansion, the prestige of British universities did not decline, if anything, it increased. Our position in international rankings of universities rose rather than fell. That is not in itself a bad thing. The research preeminence of British universities produces benefits that spill over into many areas of our economy and society. Supporters of UK higher education are absolutely right that British universities punch above their weight. However, it does raise an obvious question how precisely did we pull off that trick of getting British universities to be amongst the most prestigious in the world? And of course the argument I'm giving here is that there was this shift away from teaching towards research. And I'll sum up what I'm saying so far simply by, with two, quid, two statements. Unfunded expansion led to a smaller pie and the increasing priority attached to research meant that students received a smaller fraction of the smaller pie. To understand the changes that have taken place in higher education during the last half century, it is critical to appreciate that there has been this shift in the balance between teaching and research. The increasing priority attached to research has undermined an informal division of labour that permitted academics to exploit their comparative advantage as between teaching and research. The breakdown in this informal specialisation has come at the expense of teaching and learning. I will now give what I call Mandy Rice Davies' objection to this lecture. Now, most of you don't know who Mandy Rice Davies is. Well, some of you do, but a lot of you don't. If you're a student, you probably don't. Okay, so you can Google Mandy Rice Davies and you'll find out who she was. She's one of my heroines, okay? And she said, famously, he would say that, wouldn't he? Mandy Rice Davis is correct. All the arguments set out in this lecture are in my interest. As a teaching fellow, I have an interest in promoting teaching. Right? However, next one, I am not the only person with a vested interest. All of us who work in higher education have a stake in the outcome and we all defend our own As students, you need to decide where your interests lie, and having done so, you must defend them. Thank you.